How old is an ancient woodland? The mile-thick ice, which covered northern Europe and America for over a hundred thousand years, finally melted some 13,000 years ago and new wild forests began to re-establish themselves. 10,000 years ago, the wildwood covering most of what is now England and northern Europe. One World Woods would have been a tiny part of that vast forest. The woodlands were inhabited by Mesolithic, um, that's Middle Stone Age to you and me, uh, and they were hunter-gatherers. Aerial surveys show the first signs of human activity to be Bronze Age earthworks and the Henge. By about 3800 BC, the inhabitants of the area had taken up agriculture and had begun clearing parts of the woodland areas. The earliest evidence of occupation in Wombwell Woods is the site of the Romano-British farm. Evidence of clearance is also found in local place names ending in Lee or Field, as in Smithley and Hemingfield, which both mean a woodland clearing or cleared area in Anglo-Saxon. By the end of the Anglo-Saxon period, it's clear from the Doomsday Book that the wood was owned and used as a woodland pasture. It recorded three landowners, two of whom owned woodland. One of these was for an area five and a half furlong square, amounting to some 302 acres. This almost certainly referred to the area now covered by Wombwell Woods today, about 272 acres. Today, Wombwell Woods offers a fascinating combination of woodland and grassland, which is a popular area for local people to walk and fish. But from the earliest days, woodlands also had an important economic role and provided a livelihood to the people who lived nearby. Who better to tell us about those uses then Professor Melvin Jones, an expert on historical woodlands in South Yorkshire. How old does it have to be before you can actually call it an ancient woodland or not call it an ancient woodland? Well, this has varied over time, but basically the year 1700 is used as the, as the tide mark, as it were, because before 1700, people didn't plant trees to make woods so that the 1700 is the mark but what you try to do is to find documentary evidence of the wood in existence earlier uh, so uh, there was a survey in the 1980s by the Countryside Commission uh, and they sort of labelled all the woods throughout the country and you'd be glad to know that one well wood was included what was the first date that Wombwell Woods were mentioned? Well, it's over 900 years ago in the Doomsday Book. And the Doomsday Book says that there were three Saxon lords in Wombwell, and two of them, called Tor and Tory, had between them woodland. And it, when you uh, multiply their uh, measurements into acres, it's a, almost exactly the same as one well wood is today, within about 25 acres. So that, that's the earliest record, and they were, they were Saxon lords of the manor. You can identify an ancient wood usually from its shape. And when you look at a map of the modern one well wood today, it's got little bays and headlands and so on in its shape. And that's because the surrounding land has been cleared over time. And when you look at the local place names around the wood, they've got Anglo-Saxon clearance names like Lee and Field and Stubbin 
and so on and so on. Royd is another one. Uh, so you can tell that it's, it's, it's the remains of when they were clearing the land to farm. In, in the Doomsday Book it's described as silver pastilis and that means wood pasture. Oh, right. So, so what happened is that all the tenants of the Lords of the Manor would graze their cattle down on the meadows by the river Don and Dern in spring and then in late spring they'd move them off because a meadow isn't for grazing, it's for growing grass for cutting for hay. And then they had to move it off so the grass could grow and then move the cattle up to the commons including Unwell Wood. Yep. And there's still a lane called Summer Lane which is the route for the cattle from the, from the known part of the township into the wooded common. And in autumn, they would bring in the pigs because behind me is an oak tree, a sessile oak, which is the normal oak in these parts. And you can tell a sessile oak because it's got stalked leaves and unstalked acorns. But the tenants had another right as well. And this was called the right of Estovers. And that means be necessary and that means that they could take wood and timber from the wood for certain things and these were called boats and timber was houseboat for building and repairing mm -hmm. the houses cart boat and plow boat for making the carts and plows uh, hedge boat for making hurdles and fire boat firewood Right, uh, looking at this uh, this mighty oak, it's a strange shape. It looks as if it might have been sort of worked on before now. It almost looks like it's been coppiced. It has, and it would have been cut down to ground level to what's called a stool, and then that would grow back. Now, with it being a wooded common, they'd have either had to fence off the land after they coppiced it because the grazing animals would eat the new growth. Mm. And what you do is you cut it down to a stool and then the poles grow back. You can see the, how big the poles are because it's a neglected coppice. And you cut it again every seven or thirty years. And right. around here the coppice cycle as it's called was about 22 years yeah. and that was for making charcoal. Ah, charcoal burners around. Yeah. Yeah, oh yes, but if you were cutting it, if it was a hazel, you might cut it after seven to ten years because that would be for making hurdles and baskets, so you'd want much slimmer poles on that. Right. And when you made the charcoal, you, you cut the poles to four foot lengths, which is called cordwood, and piled it up in a pile, and the, uh, you get a pile of cords that are four feet high, four feet wide, eight feet long, it's called a cord, and that's the way you sold it. And I presume if you investigated the wood, you'd find the places where they made the charcoal. They're called charcoal hearths or pit steads. I mean, Nickel Saw Woods, for instance, which is a, a wood a bit bigger than Wormwell Wood, but not much. There are 150 charcoal hearths in that one wood. A lot. <laughs> you, you wonder how the woodland survived if there was so much right. wood being used. And I mean, the charcoal makers had to live near near the where they were making charcoal because you, you stacked you, what they did is that they, they drove an upright in and then stacked these four foot lengths of coppice wood against them to make a pile about 15 feet in diameter about five feet high covered it with turves and ash and dust till it was airproof and then they pulled the thing out because that made the yep. central flu, yep. poured red hot char charcoal down, sealed it, and then they'd stood and waited for and just between left two it. to ten days yes. uh, to, until and the white haze turned to a blue haze and then disappeared altogether. Then they'd rake it off and sell it. Coming up to date, is this wood of any economic use anymore or is it just, just for recreation? Well, I suppose it, it, it's part of our cultural heritage. Uh, I mean, you'll have to talk to the Forestry England people about that, about what they see it in economic terms. Uh, I think more and more, if you go into a post-industrial society, the, the, the place that you live in becomes important. You don't have to go to a coal field to set up a business anymore. You can go to the nicest place you can find. And why not come to a place that's got nice woodland and countryside? 
uh, so it can be an economic asset as well. And it takes us back to the to the roots of our history. It's an important cultural phenomenon. It's as important as a, a country house or a cathedral, an ancient wood. How can people who come here just to enjoy being in it help to keep it uh, not in pristine condition but at least keep it safe well i think you've got to i mean i, I don't know if there is one but I, I, most woods that that are looking good at the moment have got a friends group you know you might have two or three hundred people in that group and they'll come round and make sure that there's no litter uh, and they'll they'll interpret it they'll they'll, they'll find money to buy uh, approaching the heritage lottery to f do a leaflet or an information board and that they stop any signs of any development to, to cut down any of the wood and so on and so forth and mm -hmm. you, you know you've got to keep an eye on things yes because uh, th th there's an old joke like that in the wood is expensive it doesn't grow on trees well, quite. and uh, it would be easy oh I need some timber somebody not bothered about breaking the law oh dark so yep uh, and it needs to be looked after doesn't it oh yeah i mean for instance in the uh, minor strikes <laughs> wood wood was cut down and yes. people were digging and so on and so forth <laughs> uh, but they've managed to survive they're very robust basically uh, and i think friends can also try to interpret it i mean Ancient woods, another characteristic of ancient woods is that there are certain plants that only grow in ancient woods or are more, more or less restricted to them. And to do surveys, you know, as, as it's managed, if any sort of thinning's done, to see what comes up. You know, and you can yep. keep an eye on things. And, yep. and, and you, some rare plants may, may be seen originally. But by and large. And that's what we'd like to see, I think. Yeah. Uh, uh, Professor Jones, thank you very much indeed for your contribution. Pleasure. So, to go back to our first question, how old is ancient woodland? Well, a woodland has to have been in existence before 1600 to earn this label. Forests were not planted before 1600, so older forests could once have been part of the original wildwood. Over centuries, ancient woodlands have developed their own distinctive wildlife. The ecosystems include trees, plants, birds, small mammals, reptiles and insects. How has the role of the recently established Forestry England changed? Um, well, as you say, the Forestry Commission was established after the First World War, basically because of timber shortages in the war, and we nearly lost the war because of, of those timber shortages. So that was our original purpose, and as you say, we, we mostly established new plantations of pine, spruce and softwood, um, a lot of it for, for pit props for, for the mines, which we don't have now. And, and it's fair to say that that was the focus until probably the late 1960s, um, when timber still important but we realized that we we're managing a lot of land for people and the nature conservation aspect came into it as well um, forestry england uh, came about when after devolution um, scotland and wales the parts of the forestry commission there split off so we're the remnant of the forestry commission in england uh, have we seen the last of the surrey soldierly ranks of pine trees yet um yeah because you know um forest design and and silviculture have moved on and then you have to understand that those were new forests and that was what what it was needed then but of course as those forests develop and they're restructured and we introduce different species and broad leaves like these oak and birch um, the forests just look totally different and, and people appreciate them more and more. We manage forests and it's kind of called multi-purpose forestry now so instead of just timber as in you know the, the early 1900s um, we now manage the forests uh, for, for people for nature and for the economy so that means that, that those three things depending on the wood are equally important so um, for instance I think we have something like 220 odd million day visits of people in our woods throughout, throughout England so you can see how important that is for, for people uh, for the health when they, they like to go in the woods um, but the timber part is really important so that's for the economy um, 
timber, uh, I think as, as Mel Jones was, was, was saying, it's a sustainable raw material. We have thinned this wood recently, so you can see these, these, these trees around us. Um, we can get firewood from them, which is the basic. Um, then things like for furniture, uh, for, for dunnage, um, fencing, uh, we'll cut trees down, but they'll grow again, so it, it's sustainable in that sense. Obviously, commercial uh, interests are very much involved with you, but how much do you have to involve the public at large? Um, well, commercial interest is just one of those three stat strands, so, so the money we make from timber goes back into the woods to provide the paths or the facilities for people. Um, but obviously we do d depend on the public because they use our woods, their our eyes and ears, um, and as in things like the, the angling club, um, you know, they, they, they pick up litter, uh, they, they close the gates for the car park and, and generally they, they help us manage the woods and, and the community more and more, especially in places like Wombwell, are, are more and more important. What is special about Wombwell Wood? Um, I think the two things, well no, there are three really because we have, we've only kind of touched on it. But Mel Jones talked about the, the, the past uses, but for example in the wood we've got what's called a scheduled ancient monument, which is a, um, a, a Romano-British settlement, so it's an old farm of the Saxons that he was talking about, so that's of national interest, so we have to look at that. But there's also the things since then, there are bell pits, you know, all the mining that's been associated with it. It's an ancient woodland, so it's, 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 it's special for that. But it's also special for the community involvement. This is a big community wood. What do you see as the future of Britain's ancient woodlands in, say, 50 years from now? It's difficult for me to say about the future of, of, of all ancient woodlands, but certainly ones within Forestry England, you know, we do protect them and we seek to expand them in the, you know, the flora and fauna, fauna that Dr Jones talked about. We want to expand that out into, into adjoining woodland and, and that's what's happening at Wormwell. So you've got the new planting behind us and, and these, these plants and animals will move into that and so basically uh, enlarge what, what is ancient woodland. I want to know more about the fishing club development that Forestry England has negotiated. So, I'm joined here by Terry Smith, treasurer of the fishing club, who knows all about it. What's the name of your fishing club and how long have you been running? It's Wall Dam Community Angling Club and we've been running approximately 15 months. So, not very long, but I, I, tell, I hear tell you've got plenty of members now. Uh, we've got 50 annual members. Uh, but there's a group of us, as 11 of us, what actually form the committee and that's what we've been doing all the work. How easy or even difficult was it to set it up in the first place? Uh, wasn't, well, it was all down to Albion and uh, the Forestry Commission. Uh, they, they asked to meet us, or we asked to meet them. You met them at Wimwell Library, 28th of August 2018. Uh, we asked him what were the plans for the for the dam uh, and he actually said we hadn't really got any we'd had that much trouble from the, the last leaseholder so he says what's you know what would you like to do he said I'd like to form a community angling club uh, all run by volunteers on a non-profit basis uh, any money is what we do it we did make would actually come back into their venue materials equipment and such like and restocking uh, and yeah, we are with Grace, we got, uh, got 12 months lease and then he, he met with the angling, club, uh, with the angling trust yeah. and extended it to three years. Um, how do you and your members view this 15 month arrangement uh, with Forestry England? Is it working well or, or, or have you still got things to sort out? No, it's working very well actually. Uh, we liaise with Alvin fairly regular. We don't do anything, you know, against his wishes. Uh, and yeah, it's been, it's been working really well. Um, do you help in some ways yourself volunteering to keep this woodland in good condition? Oh yeah, definitely. We, uh, me and my colleague are just walking around and we come around twice a day. Uh, if there's anything needs doing, we'll put, put it to group and we'll decide when we can get it done. We've already repaired the, the, dam, the dam head on this little one. We've repaired the bridge, which we're beginning to 
create holes in it. So yeah, we keep on top of things. Uh, we've just repaired the pass from the rain of what we've had. And yeah, it's, it's all been going good. I don't see particularly many stages. That means it might be difficult for disabled anglers, but you're not ruling them out, I hope. Oh, no, no, definitely not. No, we're looking to address this, this on the next year. We're looking to address this situation. We've got some stages on the big pond. They're all, all in place except four. We're looking to try and keep this top pond natural because of it's the difficulty in putting the stagings in. Because whatever we put in has got, got to be secure. Uh, and yeah, that open for the, the next year, that's that's one of the plans. Have you got enough volunteers to actually run it and keep the machine oil that makes the fishing club? Uh, at the minute we've got 11, 11 members and it has, it has been going fairly well but yeah, there is things which we feel we could have done with outside help. Uh, but a lot of people that walk around say, yeah, you know, how do we get involved? But then that's last we hear of them. Whether they're just saying it to be polite or not, I don't know, but they're, they're all positive that it's looking good and I think if we did need some help, I think they would do it, yeah. Apart from the spectacle of the trees, the beauty and harmony of the woodland lies in the natural wildlife that makes its home here. Numerous species in Britain depend upon woodlands for their food and habitat. In Wombwell Woods, badgers! hedgehogs and even the shy elusive wood mouse. These are three of the dozen or so small mammals that you just might come across. Bats, amphibians, insects, fungi and reptiles, more like this common lizard, are also represented and then of course there are the birds. You could expect to find some 12 to 15 different species in Wombwell Woods which are permanently resident. You can hear them in the background as I speak, but really there's too much tree cover to see many of them. You can identify the presence of the greater spotted woodpecker by its staccato drumming on tree trunks. Winter flocks of long-tailed tits forage in the treetops with their insistent Z Z Z call. The tiny tree creeper can be mistaken for a mouse as it runs up the trunks of the trees. As Melvin Jones has told us, One World Woods have probably seen many rural crafts carried out within it, including charcoal burning and coppicing for basket making, but they have also undergone limited industrial exploitation. Old bell pits, the earliest mines for digging out near to the surface coal and ironstone have been found. Though long disused and now overgrown, the remains of a large quarry can be found here on the eastern edge of the woods. For many local people, Wombwell Woods is famous for being haunted. That's right. Reports of strange lights and sounds have been heard in the past and a number of frightening sightings in the woods. Join me at the Convict's Tunnel. People who enter it often experience paranormal sensations and hear voices. It's also been explored by investigators of the paranormal who have reported that their equipment has been interfered with. But for me... It's just a right of way for the local farmers to go through the old Great Central Line from Wath as an accommodation tunnel. Although it's rumoured to have been built by convict in the 19th century, it was reputedly used in transporting them to and from Wakefield Prison. Now, it's only about 60 metres long. Here... Wombwell, Wakefield. Well, you decide if it was used for that. So, here we are, back where we started. Right at the car park of Wombwell Woods. It's been a nice day. 
both Dave the cameraman and myself are somewhat beat because we've been walking around quite a lot but it's all to get you the good feeling of what it's like to come here and visit One World Woods. You can bird watch, you can fish, you can look for mammals, you can look for reptiles as well. They're all here and just remember as you're walking up and down it you're walking on 3,000 years of history. Now where else around here can you say that? So, until the next programme, it's bye from me. <laughs>